Welcome to Seasoned. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. As usual, we have a great episode for you this week. Our guests are three people who are making a real impact through food. You know Chef Michael Simon from his many years as a judge on the Food Network and as a co-host of The Chew. Well, coming up, Michael talks with us about his latest cookbook and how he uses food to manage his health. And then later in the hour, I talk with urban farmer and educator Lauren Little about tree tending and how she teaches students to tap sugar maples in Hartford. But first, you're going to hear our conversation with Jamie McDonald, owner of Bear's Smokehouse Barbecue. There are four locations across Connecticut. Jamie checked in with us on March 8th from the Ukraine-Poland border. He's been serving hot meals to refugees as a volunteer for Chef Jose Andreas' organization, World Central Kitchen. Jamie McDonald, thank you so much for joining us on Seasoned. We sure do wish it was under different circumstances. Thank you for having me. Before we start, we just want to make sure you're in a safe space. Um, and where are you exactly? We can see from your picture that you're outside somewhere. <laughs> well, I'm at our kitchen location, which is about five miles from the Medica uh, border crossing there between Ukraine and, and Poland. It's a huge commercial kitchen that World Central Kitchen set up to supply. There's about 12 different locations that we supply out of this kitchen. Uh, right now, we're in about 20,000 meals a day. Why did you choose that specific location? Or was that what you could get access to? It's all arranged through World Central Kitchen, but uh, it was uh, just an empty warehouse space that they had access to. And it's kind of a convenient spot to hit all the major routes from a, a distribution standpoint. Jamie, just to kind of explain to our listeners, why was it so important for you to be there and cooking in person? Um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm the type of person that, you know, I had the ability and the opportunity to help and I would never pass it up. Just like everybody back home, I see on TV, you know, just the struggles that these people are going through. And if I could be here and you know, provide a meal to somebody and, and, and improve their day for even the minutes that they're eating it. Even if it's a, a, a second, you know, it's worth it because these people have lost everything. They've lost their homes. A lot of cases, the fathers are staying in Ukraine because they have to fight. So they've lost their father or husband or you know, brother. Or, and so my sacrifice by coming here is negligible compared to that. And you feel safe where you are currently? You feel... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's we're in Poland. Uh, we don't cross into, into Ukraine just because of security concerns. Uh, we have some local support that do. Uh, we've been bringing food all throughout Ukraine. And if things get too close, which they are, uh, the last missile strike uh, was maybe 20 miles from here. Wow. It's far enough away we didn't, we couldn't hear it or anything. Um, but you hear about it the next day and it's like, wow, that is really close. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, that's closer than Hartford to New Haven. You'll hear some sirens in a moment. And this is not uncommon, as Jamie tells us. We asked him to describe what he's been seeing on the border and what his interactions with Ukrainians crossing into Poland have been like. Uh, in the kitchen, of course, you don't have any any interaction, but I try to spend about 25 to 30 percent of my day down on the border uh, serving uh, once or it just depends on what our, our cooking load is and how much time I have left at the end of the day. But the, the border crossing is open 24 seven and it's a constant stream of people. And I'd say to my estimate, I'd say it's at least 90 percent women, children and elderly. Because uh, like I mentioned before, you know, most of the men have had to stay and fight. But you just see, I mean, you see sadness, you see anxiety, you see mothers crying, but trying to hide it from their children. It's really, really horrible what they're going through. But at the same time, you see their resiliency and their strengths. And, you know, they've just, for the most part, crossed, you know, one lady I talked to, she had been traveling for over 48 hours by foot. This was when I first got here and it was cold. It was, you know, in the teens and 20s at night, snowing. Uh, with two small children and, you know, they all have backpacks and their suitcases and they finally made it. And they're, you can see they're exhausted and just want somewhere safe. And we're really the, the first people that they see once they cross the border. So, and of course there are other, you know, and that's one of the things that's amazing. There's, there's so many organizations from all around the world down here trying to support, um, offer their support, but this is their first safe spot. And so from here, once they cross the border, you know, they get food, they get supplies. There's even, you know, there's the, the cellular phone companies there. They give them new SIM cards because their SIM cards won't work uh, from Ukraine into Poland. Then, then from there, they get on buses and go to either the train station or there's local shelters that have been set up. I mean, the Polish people have been amazing in their response. You know, they've taken whole shopping centers and converted them into shelters. And then from there they go, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> and I don't think a lot of them know, you know, and that's the, that's the part is, you know, 
Uh, some of them are headed into other countries. Um, some of them will stay in Poland. I know from what I hear, uh, a lot of the Polish cities are, are reaching their maximum because um, there's been over, you know, I think the last, last estimate was over 2 million people have fled uh, have fled Ukraine. And if the fighting case continues to push west, they estimate there'll be another 5 million. So if you put that in perspective, I mean, that's that's more people than the whole state of Connecticut. <laughs> wow. You know, and... Um, they all had to find somewhere to live because they're, they're not going to be able to return home anytime soon. And even when they're, once they're able to, if, it, if that is ever going to happen, they might not even have a home back home. You know, it could have been destroyed. Um, you know, like I said, the one lady, she showed me pictures of her, her apartment building that had been hit by a bomb, either a bomb or a missile. And, you know, the whole upper quarter of the building was gone. So it's, it's, it's sad. Very sad. Unbelievable. Jamie, what, as you said, they crossed the border. The first safe spot a lot of these people are finding is are you guys. And food obviously offers that warmth and that feeling of comfort. What kind of food are you guys serving over there? Uh, for the most part, just stuff that's easy to handle for them. So a lot of stews, a lot of soups. We make, God, probably 300 gallons of hot cocoa a day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've started making, a few days ago, we started making applesauce for babies because uh, unfortunately there's a lot of babies that are, and there's not a lot of baby food available. Um, so yeah, just stuff like that, you know, and it's, it's stuff that, you know, that we're proud to serve. It's all, we, it's all made from scratch. Um, usually one batch of stew is about 1500 meals. Um, hold on. I'll wait till the sirens come down. <laughs> That's terrifying just to hear a siren. Has that been a common sound for you since you, since you got there? Yeah. Yeah. Sirens are common, and in the last few days, also seeing much more military presence, um, which is interesting. Well, interesting in that um, that it looks like they're probably building up their forces along the border. Um, it's another thing that's really just awesome to see is you know you're down there at the border crossing, and there are people that are fleeing from one military, and the Polish military has a very heavy presence at the crossings, and the Polish police, and they are all so just awesome to these people just they help them as soon as they get across the border they're grabbing their bags for them they're helping their elderly onto the buses um i've seen you know the polish police out there handing out gloves to the small children and, and candy and just anything you know and always smiling and just welcoming and and it's it's just awesome a lot of compassion is being shown as a as a navy veteran and i'm, I'm going to be mindful of your time but as a navy veteran what is this like for you personally to be back so close to the front lines of of what's happening, um, it's concerning, and but at the same time, you know that there will be enough time to to evacuate if needed, and you just you just have to applaud the the, the courage of you know I've also seen a lot of volunteers heading into into Ukraine to help fight, you know, and and you can't just give up. It's hard to see, but it's also these people are standing up for what they believe and they're standing up for their homes. And you see just, you know, like I said, you see a lot of sadness down there. And that, that's, you know, sometimes you want to cry yourself. Of course, you can't, not in front of them. <laughs> you know, like I said, you have to keep a positive, you know, a positive look and, and a welcoming, a welcoming smile. So you get home at night and you just think about it. And, you know, I usually I'll do a post at home because I'm trying to raise money to support World, uh, World Central Kitchen through my Facebook uh, page. And then also um, we're doing uh, sauce and rub sales through the restaurants and the grocery stores. Yeah, I think that a great spot to go is how people in Connecticut can help. And that's a great segue into that. The amount of support I've been shown from the people back home is amazing. Um, not only from people I know, but I've had people that I don't know, you know, writing me and just expressing support and donating. And that's what I just telling everybody is, you know, if you want to volunteer over here, especially with World Central Kitchen, just go to their website and sign up. And, you know, they, they have a wait list right now, but when the need is there, they'll call you up and you can get over here. Um, but other than that, monetary donations. It's the one thing you hear, not only from World Central Kitchen, but the other organizations I've talked to, they need funds to do what they're doing. And it's more efficient for them to use those funds than to try to ship a uh, sea container full of used clothes. Um, and I don't know if anybody's looked on my on my post, but I've also, you know, I've, I've shown pictures of, you know, huge piles of just of clothes, you know, just all thrown together, just sitting outside. It's not because people don't care. It's that there's no infrastructure put in place. There's no way to just to, to effectively distribute it here. But yeah, monetary donations, um, spread the word. And, and that's really it. Jamie McDonald, thank you for all that you're doing for so many people in need. And we appreciate the time you're spending with us today. 
No, absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. And uh, hello to everybody back home. Hey, Jamie, stay safe, man. We look forward to getting home safe. Awesome. Thank you, guys. That was Jamie McDonald, the bear behind Bear Smokehouse Barbecue. Do you want to help? You can find links to Jamie's Facebook page and his fundraiser benefiting World Central Kitchen on our show page, ctpublic.org slash seasoned. 25% of the sales of bear sauces and rubs are going toward World Central Kitchen right now. Listeners can purchase the products online at any of the bear's locations in Connecticut or in local supermarkets that carry them. Later in the hour, my conversation with another hometown hero, traveling teacher Lauren Little. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. Coming up after the break, we talk with Chef Michael Simon about his new book and about the challenges of teaching people how to cook online. Oh, I don't have arugula. Could I substitute a chicken? No, you can't substitute a chicken. Oh, I know that. This is Seasoned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Seasoned. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. While our next guest, Chef Michael Simon, looks like the picture of health when you see him on TV or cooking on Facebook Live, he has managed not one, but two autoimmune diseases for much of his life. He has lupus, and he's one of the more than one million Americans living with rheumatoid arthritis. We spoke with him about his latest cookbook, Fix It With Food, and the system he's developed for creating recipes that amp up the joy of eating without triggering inflammation or discomfort. Michael Simon. Thank you for joining us on Season. I am happy to be here. A little known fact for people who may have lived under a rock, you suffered from chronic pain for a good chunk of your life, and that actually informed the way you cook food now. And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. I, so I'm in my 50s now, sad to say, but... You don't look up that day past 27. <laughs> You're a terrific liar, even on Zoom. In my 20s, I found out I had discoid lupus and RA. Through most of my my mid to late twenties and thirties and forties, I just ate, did what I wanted to do, and suffered, and that was that, you know. And, and as I was getting older, either the pain was getting more intense or my pain threshold was going down. I'm not a hundred percent. I don't know what it could be a combination of both of those things, but nonetheless, I was feeling shit more often. <laughs> so I didn't want to go on all these meds for it. So basically, I started playing with my diet, trying to figure out like. Are there things that I am eating that are causing me to feel this way? And the the journey, oh my God, my dog now decides this is a good time to bark. Your dog is co-signing on your journey. I wanted to know what was causing it more than I wanted to say, like, I'm going to 100% eliminate all these things from my world. Like, I kind of think of it a little bit in the sense of, like, I drink whiskey. So if I have two whiskeys, I'm fine the next day. If I have five whiskeys, I feel really crappy the next day. It's kind of like that with the food. It's like we explain in the two Fix It With Food books, we like give you a reset. That it's basically two weeks of being a vegan, which for me is like a death march. But nonetheless, I get through these two weeks and it resets you. And then you add things back one at a time to figure out what your triggers are. For me, my triggers were sugar and dairy. The good news is, is they weren't beef and pasta. Or whiskey. Or whiskey, exactly. <laughs> so... Most of the time, I do a very good job of eliminating sugar and dairy from my diet. But when my granddaughter's over and she wants to eat ice cream, I eat a whole pint of graters and that's just that. And I know that the next day I'm going to feel terrible, but I'm not going to like live my life in this bubble where it's like, I can't eat. I hate the word diet. I think it's a stupid word. It's like a set up for failure situation. And at the end of the day, I'm a chef. So if I want to finish the sauce with butter and taste it, I'm going to finish the sauce with butter and taste it. But at least now I know what's causing the inflammation and some of the pain. So the book is is as much about how to learn a little bit more about yourself and how food affects you and then living your life in a manner where you could reduce the pain but still enjoy yourself. What are some of those daily challenges that you had with that and managing them? And then when you try something like, you know, a little sauce with butter that you've monte au bird, excuse my French, and you taste it. Does just that little bit of butter make a difference? Uh, you know, a little bit of butter is not going to hurt me. Maybe a, a little bit of aches and pains. 
I use the ice cream. I, I love ice cream. I love ice cream so much. I, I can't even tell you how much I love ice cream. <laughs> and, you know, some people like chocolate, some people like whatever. Like for me, it's ice cream. So ice cream's hard for me not to have. And don't give me that dairy free, <laughs> stupid ice cream. Like, I, I would rather just suffer, to be honest. Like, if I want sorbet, I'll have sorbet, damn it. But I want, when I have ice cream, I want ice cream. Yeah. Wait, I'm going to walk with you guys real quick. And my dog. And show us your ice cream. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to no. show you my ice cream. I'm going <laughs> to let Norman in. That's a cute puppy. <laughs> oh my God, be quiet. Can't you see I'm on a Zoom, Norman? Have you, do you know nothing? No tofu or the tofu ice cream, then, huh, Chef? Not doing that. Oh, God. Oh, God, no. That ain't ice cream. <laughs> don't bring that up. <laughs> Michael, it's it's interesting. I, I'm the same way. I'm like, I don't have a milkshake, and I don't really eat a lot of cheeseburgers. But when I do, it better be fattening. It better be dripping with grease. It better be really good. 100%. I would rather have one real experience than 10 fake ones. Right. When we started the conversation, you said you hate the word diet. You look at your book. This seemed like a way for you to manage your pain. I wonder if you could, in your words, describe what your mission was in putting this book together. Because really what you're doing is, it's a bit of a memoir because you're sharing your life experience with people. And that memoir is translating into food and into what people can make and prepare for themselves. I realized that I had these issues and I realized that they were caused by inflammation. So, you know, like any of us do, you start to research it. Like you start going, okay, what are the ingredients I could have? What are some of the things that cause inflammation? Then my curiosity got me like, let's look for some books that talk about this. Most of the books at the time were, you know, the first fix with food came out four years ago, five years ago. But at the time they were like more doctor driven books and the recipes in them were like gruel. Like I'm like, <laughs> I'm eating this crap. This is disgusting. So then I'm like, I know that there's a way to do this where we could still make delicious food and anything that you cook out of the book, you would never say like, Oh, this is dairy free. You would just say this is delicious. For me, that's kind of how food has to work. I can't have it the other way. You know, like I've been with my wife Liz for almost 30 years. For a majority of that time, she was a vegetarian. For a portion of that time, she was a vegan. What made me famous as a chef was my ability to cook meat. And I married a vegetarian. Like, (laughs) I uh, certainly I didn't win her over with my cool cooking skills, (laughs) you know. But but her being a vegetarian and then even a vegan, it was great for me as a cook. You know, because it's easy to make certain foods taste good, like fat and animal fat and butter and all those things. Like they make most things taste better almost instantly. But like when she was a vegan, I was like, oh, my God, like and Liz, she's a psalm. So she's been in the restaurant business her whole life and she's a very good cook, too. But I really had to continue to learn more about flavors. My secret as a chef always in in my younger days was like fat, acidity fresh herbs. If I had to describe the flavor profiles of my food, I would say fat, acidity, herby, crunchy stuff. Yeah. Finish it with lemon, hit it with those fresh herbs. It's probably going to taste good in the end. Yeah. Like, you know, steak with a vinegary salad on top with some crunchy herbs and some crunchy garnishes and a little butter. (laughs) Perfect. Now it's like, okay, we're not just going to make dinner and I'm going to throw a steak on mine and she's going to eat hers without the steak. That's stupid. So I started cooking more and more vegetarian and vegan stuff with Liz and you start relying on, oh, like bringing in more spices, bringing in more of this, bringing in more of that, developing flavor, making your palate satisfied without just hitting it with the fat acid bomb and, and the sweet, like a little bit of sugar, like those kind of, like you find other ways. And it just, it made me a better cook. And it made me realize like I could do this book. And that was the goal for me. It was like, yes, I want to teach people how I went about eating to make myself feel better. But I also don't want it to be like, oh, you suffer from inflammation. The other four members of your family don't. So you're going to cook dinner for yourself that no one else is going to enjoy. So Michael, is, is this how you came to this concept of the master substitution chart? Because you didn't want to sacrifice on flavor. Correct. And you didn't want to have a subpar meal for yourself and watch everybody else enjoy food. Well, yeah. So the, the substitution part came to, of two things, that and also when we started doing Simon's dinners during like the first day of the pandemic, when they shut down New York, we started doing Simon's dinners on Facebook. When we started doing the Facebook live show, all of a sudden there's just these running questions, constant questions. And like Liv, who was my niece who was shooting it, would like ask me the questions as they're coming in. And 
chef, you like as chefs, sometimes you we assume people know maybe more. Oh, than absolutely. They do. I teach these classes all the time online. I just say things and you assume that they know what you're talking about, you know, because it's so normal. Yeah, you just assume. I've been teaching people how to cook for all these years. The weirdest thing, like, it's like, you'd say like, okay, add the bacon. Well, I don't have bacon. Could I substitute walnuts? No, walnuts are not a substitution for bacon. You know, or like, oh, I don't have arugula. Could I substitute a chicken? No, you can't substitute a chicken. Right. You know, so... All these kind of things started happening. And I was like, oh, my God, like, <laughs> this is mesmerizing for me. I, I didn't know this was a thing. Like, <laughs> I, I just didn't know. So the substitution came from trying to find something with a similar profile that wasn't what it was in its true state. Correct. And from listening to people say, can I substitute arugula for chicken? You were so <laughs> appalled that you were like, I got to I got to set the American public straight. <laughs> Not I wasn't appalled. I was shocked. Yeah. And then the other thing of it is the fear of substituting. Oh, you're sauteing that right. in butter. Could I saute it in oil? Right. So there was a combination of like the weird substitution and the fear of substitution. And a lot of it happened during the pandemic because it's Everyone remembers in the beginning of the pandemic, you go to the grocery store and you couldn't go with the list. Whatever was there, you bought it. So when we were doing the show, I would go to the grocery store and I would just buy anything I could buy and then come home and cook it. I have cannellini beans. You could use kidney, black, blah, 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 blah. It was very liberating for people all of a sudden. I'm like, oh, if you don't have a beef chop, use a pork chop. I could use a pork chop. Of course you well, can. Because people want to, they, they want to so, stick right to that recipe. They're not, they're not good about deviating away from that. And you know, no. and, and the fix it with food approach includes a reset. And I'm still, uh, chef, I'm, I'm still floored about the, the wife being a vegetarian. She knows you wrote a book <laughs> called Carnivore, right? I'm just pointing that out. So this is my, Liz is a vegetarian. Our son Kyle is allergic to red meat. My culinary director Katie has been a vegetarian, not a vegetarian for like the 17 years that we've worked together. My daughter-in-law is a vegetarian. I'm like, God hates me. <sighs> well, that's the way it goes sometimes. But that's got to make the reset, though, easy for you because it's basically 10 days of clean eating. Can you right. talk about that a little bit and kind of how do we get there? Like, how does it you know, trigger foods that might cause inflammation, those sort of things? There's a lot of vegetables. The first thing that I discovered was that everyone's triggers were different, which was very shocking, surprising to me. It wasn't, it wasn't. But I was like, you, you know, you would think if you suffer from RA or lupus or some of these other inflammatory issues, like just don't eat this or don't eat that and you'll be fine. But it turned out that it was not that simple. And the things that were causing inflammation were meat, dairy, sugar, flour, and alcohol. So those were like the big ones. It's like everything. Yeah, everything basically, unless you're a vegan. Yeah. Well, no, because flour. So basically for those 10 days, You eliminate all those things from your diet. We create recipes in the front of the book that allow you to have delicious food during that time. Here's the thing about the reset that is, for me, was like great, but also kind of sad and aggravating was at the 10th day of the reset, I could honestly say it was the best I had felt since I was like 15. I was like, oh my God, all the things I like are killing me. You know, like even Liz was like, wow, your skin looks really good. My hands felt good. My arthritis, I wasn't achy in the morning. My energy levels were high. And But then you come to the reality where I'm not eating like this. So you start adding things back in the breeze. So like you add red meat back. See how you feel the next day. If you feel fine, it's not a trigger. So you go to the next thing. Gotcha, gotcha. And until you figure out what your triggers are. So, I mean, for me, sugar and dairy... If it would have been flour and and meat, I'm an Italian kid that loves meat. So it's like, if you pull pasta and steak out of my world, I'm a sad sack. I would have just said, I'll just suffer. If someone told me I couldn't eat white rice, there's a bridge in Brooklyn. Right. But, you know, and the also kind of interesting thing, though, about all this is, and, and I mean, this really isn't shocking to any of us, I guess, but crappy flour, like flour that's been bromated, enriched, bleached. I get a little achy, but if I eat something with proper flour, like King Arthur, for example, that hasn't been bromated, hasn't been enriched, um, hasn't been bleached, nothing. 
you know, it's like kind of like when people go to Italy, they're like, oh, I have gluten intolerance, but I'm still going to eat pasta in Italy because I'm in Italy. And they're like, why didn't I feel crappy? Because in Italy, they don't let you do all these horrible things to your products. You know, same with like sugar is one of my triggers. Now, if it's like white sugar, it affects me. But if I go to the farmer's market down the street and I buy local honey, the sugar doesn't mess with me. It's not like I can't use things that create sweetness. I just can't use specific things that create sweetness. We talk about all the time, Chef, how certain bakers we even have that are grinding their own flour now. People who have gluten allergies tend to not even react to them. So it's really interesting to see. Let's talk about a little breakfast for a second there, Chef. What are some of the favorites in the breakfast section or some of the go-tos you like? I go through obsessions with food a little bit. Like I make myself something that I haven't had in a while. And then I'm like, oh my God, I just, I forgot how much I love this. So then I can't stop making it. So like when I was a kid growing up, I forced came from a family of, of pretty good cooks. Like my mom is Greek and Sicilian. She's very strong in the kitchen. My grandfather was a, was a great cook. My dad's a decent cook. My father worked midnights. So I used to stay with my grandparents on the weekends and we would go to, there's a, a market in Cleveland called the West Side Market. It's like an old Eastern European market and the, one of the oldest in the United States. It's 110 years old now. We would go shopping and he would buy like all the house cured meats and all that kind of stuff that were there. Then we would come back and he would make fried eggs. And it's like, you know, you go to culinary school and they're like, oh, you know, you gently cook the egg and you make the omelet and, you know, you whisper to it and you shouldn't be over high heat and it should have soft curds and and I love all those things. Like I love an omelet without color that's a little bit runny in the center. I like scrambled eggs that I could take a nap in because they're so soft and fluffy. <laughs> but I forgot how much I liked eggs fried in cast iron or, or carbon steel pan that are like crispy as hell on the bottom and runny yolks on top. So when we did the book, we did the we did crispy eggs with like a little like an avocado salsa on top. And I literally like Katie, our culinary director, lives down the street. So she's over here all the time. It just so happens now, it's like a fluky timing thing. Every time she comes over, I'm frying eggs. She's like, is this the only thing that you eat? I'm like, Katie, I'm just obsessed with getting them. Like, Ooh, this one's a little bit, but like, I'm in a little Aleppo, a little, like, I, I just, I can't stop. So I'm currently, I've tested about eight different pans to get them exactly how I want them, including like, four different carbon steel pans, not even the same brand. Like Liz is like, you have issues, man. <laughs> a carbon steel pan. I'm like, no, nope, this one's better. Look at this. She's like, this is, you're psychotic. Like this is, you know. Oh, Are you a Virgo? <laughs> yes. It is a blessing and a curse, man. I will tell you. Yes, it is. <laughs> Are you a Virgo? I have a Virgo rising, so I present like a Virgo. I have a lot of Virgo tendencies. But can I bring us back to the eggs? Sure. Because our listeners live for a recipe. And a recipe from Michael Simon will definitely make their day. I have flipped through those pages. I was a non-believer of overnight oats until you showed me the error of my ways. They're so, so good, aren't they? Tell it, they're good, and they're good for you. And we've got the eggs covered, but can we talk about breakfast options, specifically overnight oats? Sure. Yeah, I mean, like the, the thing that I love about the overnight oats things is Typically in my life, it's like, I wake up super early. I'm up at 4.35 o'clock every day. Even when I'm not working, I'm like, what am I doing? Like, well, why do I hate myself so much? So Virgo, hashtag Virgo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and I'm like, always, I'm just, I can't sit still. Like I'm, I'm not good at sitting still, which is I'm bouncing my feet as I'm talking right now. And I'm ADD. So there's that too. Me too. So like at night, it's like, I get like these little bursts of energy and like Liz is like, I'm going to watch this show. And I'm like, okay. Like I would need a project, you know, so I'd like come in the kitchen and I'd make the overnight oats. So then in the morning I could wake up and they're ready so I could grab them when I take the dog for a walk and then I'm off and moving in another direction. So like the thing that I love about the overnight oats is like I love oatmeal, always have. Oatmeal is like one of my favorite things, but I don't have the patience to make it in the morning. The reason I like eggs so much is I could have eggs done in minutes. It doesn't matter what kind of eggs. In minutes you're done. But with the oatmeal, oatmeal needs love. You need to spin. You got to spin it. You gotta... It needs love. It's like making yeah. risotto. You can't throw risotto in a pot, and walk away, and in 20 minutes go look at this great risotto. You know, so it's the same with the oats. So, like when I started doing the overnight oats, I'm like, oh my god, this is a game changer for me. I could throw berries in it. I could throw nuts in it. I could throw dates in it. I could customize it any way I want. Totally. You know, it's 
oat milk with oatmeal works very well together, obviously. So you could eliminate the dairy. It just works good for me. So it's something that's delicious and quick. You could just grab them and eat. And then I, I also like having them in the fridge too, because, you know, there are like, if I am craving like ice cream or something creamy and rich like that, it's, it's like, this kind of will save me so that I could save the ice cream for like when I'm with Emmy. Yeah, I hit that dessert thing. Well, chef, I got to ask you too about turmeric. You know, turmeric's kind of hit a little hot phase there in the in the chef world, especially the nutritional people. But it's kind of underappreciated. It's in the ginger family, but it's really great for inflammation, isn't it? Yeah, insanely good with it for inflammation. It's a natural inflammatory, like a lot of berries and stuff are. I mean, you had to pair it with a a decent amount of black pepper to activate it but it helps tremendously with inflammation. The, the nice thing about it too is it's, it certainly has a taste, but it's not an intense flavor. So, you know, you could sneak it into, it gives more color than it gives flavor, I feel. Yeah, it's very bland, very mild. So you could sneak it into dishes where it's not like going to alter the flavor significantly. You know, it's in the ginger family, but it, it doesn't have that pop of like a ginger or, you know, the power of some other stuff. Maybe some salad dressings or a rub. Right. Yeah, it's, it's great. And I put it in dressings and stuff all the time. I also read in your book, I'm a huge fan of the chicken cutlet, especially if I bite into a chicken cutlet and there's no crunch crunch, then I've been had and I want my money back. And I think you wrote something to the effect of if you think this is not going to have crunch, you're going to wake up your neighbors with how loud this crunch is going to be. I'm paraphrasing you, but I just remember reading that line and saying, Michael Simon, look at him. He's hysterical. When some supposed to be crunchy, it best be crunchy. <laughs> right. You know, so like whenever we, we do a fried chicken or a cutlet or anything like that, it, it has to have, the texture has to be right. You know, it's because it's a textural play. It's it's like, especially with the chicken cutlet, like, I mean, I, I often make them with chicken thighs because the thigh, I feel, just has so much better flavor. But most people like to use a boneless breast or boneless skinless breast for a, a cutlet often, you know, and that's a piece of meat that's very lean, doesn't have a lot of, you know, natural that it has no today. personality no it doesn't so the texture like if you're using a breast and you took the skin off the breast like man now the texture is really important because you not only are you going to add some flavor with that exterior but you're also going to make it just more interesting to eat well, chef so nuts are a prominent thing in the reset recipes i love that idea and using like walnut pesto or, or you know the, the cleaner version of a loaded baked potato um, or your baked stuffed sweet potato with kale and walnut pesto. These are all fantastic recipes. Even you could make some cheese out of some of those nuts, right? 100%. We make a like a faux parm in the book, which I, I have to apologize to all the faux parm people because when Liz was a vegetarian, it, like I came home one day and she's like, uh, taste this. And I'm like, well, what is it? She's like, I'm not going to tell you what it is until you taste it because I, I know how you are and you're very food judgy. And you hate things with like stupid names. Like I hate that like the term zoodle makes me, me want to like jump off a cliff. Like why can't you just call it Julienne zucchini? Why do you have to call it a zoodle? So it sounds like a hairstyle. So I taste this concoction. I'm like, wow, this is really good. Like, what is this? It has like this cheesy quality to it. I know it's not cheese because at the time she was a vegan and she's like, it's faux parm. I'm like, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, only seconds prior, you were like, this is, this is half bad. Right. But then I'm like, it is good. And I tend to use it a lot. And, you know, it's a combination of nuts and nutritional yeast and a little bit of garlic. And I find myself using it a lot, like on popcorn and just finishing stuff. It has that little, um, another word that I hate, but I always use it. It has that little umami kind of blast to it. I just don't know what to use other than that word, even though I think I sound like an idiot when I say it, umami. Um <laughs> It just gives things that really nice pop for some of my Italian chef friends. Like, you know, Mark Vetri is one of my dearest friends in the world. And he's like, quit calling it parm. I'm like, shut up. Just leave me alone. <laughs> but it's tasty. Like, I don't know what else to call it. I haven't come up with another name. So call it full parm, even though I hated it when Liz called it full parm to me. I can't think of a smarter name. <laughs> I'm looking at your your shot. I'm looking at this beautiful kitchen behind you. So what do you make on a random Wednesday night for dinner, knowing that you love your red meat, but you're surrounded by vegetarians and vegans? I'm actually I'm by myself. I'm just well, me and Norman. Liz is in Cleveland and I'm in New York. Tonight, I'll probably like when I'm by myself, I tend to make pasta a lot because I could just 
whip it up really quick and you know it's easy to make in smaller portions and and it, it depends like i'll sometimes i'll just make a quick pomodoro sometimes i'll uh, a cacio pepe with your fake parmesan <laughs> with my fake parmesan yeah exactly um but like all all those kind of things that, like that i could just throw together quickly like basically in one pan and then just have a nice crispy salad and you know some bread and i'm pretty happy fried egg right chef one pan let's do it hard fried fried egg i i i already had my fried egg for breakfast today <laughs> i i'd be more than happy to make them again for you guys if you can watch i just can't get enough of them and i love breakfast for dinner too by the way like who says you can't have breakfast for dinner is crazy that's the best hack when you're a single mom of two boys i'm like fellas you want some <laughs> french toast and webitos they're like for dinner yes right it's great it's yeah. delicious Hey, Chef, what kind of feedback do you get from readers and fans and people who manage illnesses the way you do about your approach in eating? The first Fix It with Food Book when it came out, I have to say it was probably the most satisfying book that I had done personally because we just got so much response like this has changed my life. This has helped me so much. I, I can't believe this. You know, normally, you know, you write a cookbook or you, you do a recipe on TV or whatever and, and people are like, I made this for my family. Everyone loved it, which is great. I mean, that is incredibly satisfying but like for someone to say like i've been an ra sufferer for 15 years and now i could do things that i couldn't do six months ago i mean it makes you feel pretty darn good well thank you for making it thank you for making us laugh thank you for making us not feel guilty if we really do want to eat the entire pint of ice cream thanks guys i'm sorry norman was kind of making some noise in the background but dogs will be dogs shout out to norman <laughs> That was Chef Michael Simon and his bull terrier, Norman. You can find them both on Instagram at Chef Simon and at Norman Simon. By the way, Simon is spelled with a Y. We also have three recipes from Michael's book, Fix It With Food, Every Meal Easy, on our website. One is a silky tomato coconut soup that includes that famous faux parm. And there is also a Bobby Flay-inspired crispy rice dish, too. Visit ctpublic.org slash recipes. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, educator Lauren Little describes her students' reactions when she teaches them about the trees in their community and the gifts they offer. It's pretty magical. There's a lot of oohs and ahs or, miss, what's that? Just like curiosity. You're listening to Seasons on Connecticut Public Radio. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Seasoned. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. Sugar maple season in Connecticut lasts from January through March. To celebrate, Marisol asked urban farmer and educator Lauren Little to describe how she teaches students to be good tree tenders while tapping sugar maples in Hartford. Thanks for joining us on Seasoned. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Can you describe for us the work you do as a traveling teacher in Hartford? Because it sounds very cool. My job as a traveling teacher with Lauren Little Edutainment is to educate and entertain by connecting people with nature. I go to different schools and I have this 10 topics of programming. So I kind of cater it to um, next generation science standards. And I always make sure I kind of mesh it in with what the kids are learning. Why, why do you go to them? Why didn't you just have a central location and have them come to you? It's easier to go to the school. It's where the kids are. That's where I can see how they interact with their peers. It also is where the land access is. So access to land isn't always your first option. And so I'm currently focusing on getting my own land to grow my own space. But on the good side of going to the different schools, you really kind of have an opportunity to focus on different topics and bring that back to urban farming. I also go to them because that's what they asked for. And they're like, listen, I want to go outside. I want to learn how to grow food. And so I'll just follow suit with that. You must be a very popular teacher. I would hate to have <laughs> your section and then me be the math teacher and have the, the students go from you to then me. That would that would be terrible. <laughs> Especially since they're probably going to be dirty and the teacher's going to be like, what? That's right. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about um, what it means to be a tree tender Ooh. and how that involves literal tree hugging. Being a tree tender, for me, it's developing a personal relationship with trees 
really acknowledging why they're important and that they literally help us to breathe. And so I have a tree tending unit. It's one of my most favorite units. I have a guy made out of a tree. He has like dreads and his parents are from China and Jamaica. He lives in Keeney Park. Um, and so I bring him around to show the kids how to really connect with that character. And once they see an embodiment of a tree that can look like themselves, they begin to have a different type of mindset towards it. Um, and so I'm doing a tree tuning program in Harvard Public Schools at Mary Hooker. It's been awesome. There's many different ways to be a tree tender and having the kids be able to realize it for themselves what that means by telling them what trees give you, like coconuts and mangoes, but then also how to cultivate a tree specifically the trees that are in um, Hartford, it's the most common one is maple trees. So really talking to them of saying like, this is how we'll cultivate our trees. And then also hugging trees is part of a tree tradition. What I did with ESM students where they wrote a note to the trees, thanking it. They wrote a couple things about how they're going to protect the tree. And so we went outside and had the kids read a couple things. And then at the end, they give the tree a hug or they gave it depth. So yeah, that's... <laughs> That's why I like tree hugging. I love this. It, it, to me, I'm listening to you tell this, recount what you do with the students, and it's very meditative. And it's very, um, I think that by by teaching this sort of pedagogy, you're also teaching students to be in the moment. You have a really unique way of describing what you do. And to me, it feels like what I want to do as an adult, which is just be in the moment. And if you look at a tree, that's what you're doing. What is your favorite tree? Oh, that's a good question. And if you say cactus, I will roll out of this chair. <laughs> I was thinking about that. Um well, I really like pine trees. I realize I like that tree because I need to learn more about it. And so as I investigate, you know, I, I know I probably learned something else more about pine trees that I enjoy. Also, the sap really helps to relax you. You breathe it in. It makes the air, you know, feel and taste crisp in the forest. Yeah. So talk to us about that. What does the process of maple tree tapping involve since we were talking about sap? So maple tree tapping, um, I've learned that it comes from the indigenous peoples who used to live in our area. I'm also not an indigenous person, but I just want to recognize that, you know, their voices are important. And so it's also good to like seek them out and get their feedback. But what I've learned so far is that they used to tap the, the trees and have remembrance around it and use a lot of the maple to like preserve food in a lot of their meals. And so the process is... The first thing I want to do is um, have the kids practice their skills of observation. So when they're observing and doing these tree traditions, they're also taking time to look at the bark. We're taking time to look at, you know, the tree crown and the shape. And when we do that, when we remember that shape, I have the kids do yoga with their bodies. So they're like moving their arms around to get a better understanding of how like the tree branches grow opposite of each other. So once we actually get outside, they're able to identify the trees with their leaves, with their bark and their shape, because when you're in the winter, the leaves are gone. They also kind of figure out, all right, is this tree healthy enough for us to actually tap? And I always tell them, I say, don't tap a, tap a tree that's your age. You need to tap a tree that's grown <laughs> at least like 40-ish <laughs> years old. And so I kind of talk to them and I say, if you think you can hug that tree with both arms around, it's too small get a bigger tree. And so really having them do that to kind of show respect for the trees. And so the ones that they determine that they can tap the tree, I have these little like plastic taps. I know we're on radio, but I have this little demo that I wanted to show you. So it's just like this, this is a piece of like Lauren bark. is showing me a bark and it has a doohickey on it. What is that doohickey? Is that an actual tap? It's an actual tap. So there's two kinds. There's a plastic one and then there's a metal one. Um, and you can use either kind. Um, I've used both. And so what I do is I show the kids some of the tools that they were using, and then I work and guide them towards picking a spot. I tell them, I was like, you got to tap in the armpit of the tree. Tap the armpit of <laughs> the tree. Does the tree have met more than two armpits? <laughs> they can. I take my drill, so I have like a, a really large drill, and I put it in into the tree, and they're like, oh my God, what's happening? And then I take a moment to pause, and you wait like, a couple seconds you begin to see the sap come out and they're like oh oh what is this and so as the sap comes out they actually realize it's just like all the nutrients in the tree and so that's when they kind of actually start believing me and, and being like oh this really is tree water and so when i put the tap in and i hammer it in and have them come out and like taste the sap and then i show them how to collect the um sap 
most times I will use a can if I, that has like a spout on the bottom that um, people like in the, around the community can taste the tree water or take their own. Um, and so I also talk to the kids and I tell them like we're outside in the cold because these are the, these are the conditions that we need to tap. It has to be like a freezing cold night. And then the next day it's best if it's like over freezing between like 35 and 36 degrees. And so the kids kind of get comfortable being outside in the cold and realize that there's a lot more fun for them to do. Lauren, you you started talking about the importance of Native and Indigenous people, especially when it comes to educating students about the outdoors and about trees. I wonder if we could go back to that. What is the importance of educating, not just this is the process of tapping a tree for syrup, but this is why we do it and this is how we pay homage? The first thing is um, the kids are very aware and very understanding of people that are different than them. And so they have an even greater respect when they understand the history because um, I'm still learning about even where my people come from and who these indigenous and native peoples were. And so bringing that to them and imploring them to do their own research is key to just also having awareness of some of the racism that might affect them or other marginalized communities that need support. Uh, there's students that I ha- I teach a, di- a diverse amount of students. And so giving them the opportunity to speak up for these other communities will provide them with the script and the tools to hold each other accountable when maybe racism comes up. Because it will, um, regardless of who they connect with and who they speak with. And so I just want to give them some of those tools to be successful and to feel confident. I love that. I'm a mother of two boys, and now they're starving all the time. But when they were younger, and I'd say, you know, let's see where this food comes from. When you change the narrative somehow, they become a little bit more interested, I find. Um, And it sounds like that's what's happening with you and your students. What is the reaction from your students when you open up this whole new world of trees to them? It's pretty magical. There's a lot of oohs and ahs or, miss, what's that? Just like curiosity. Last week I was at um, at Free Center and I was doing like a maple tea tapping program and this young woman was so into the trees and she was like really like getting involved and checking the bark and I was like, yeah, this is what I want. At another school in the school work at Trinity Academy, I went into the school and this little boy had a piece of a branch, like a piece of a stick and was like, I don't know what this is. You think this was birch? And I was like... This is exactly what we want. We want them to be interested in it. And also, too, when they're eating the maple syrup, they can look at it and say, like, I know where this came from. Or this doesn't taste like maple syrup because we know it's made in this way. But also, too, I want them to be able to know how to cultivate things for themselves because climate change is super real. Food access and food scarcity will hit them when they're my age. And so I want them just to have the tools to be successful. I don't want my students to starve. And I want them to still enjoy a lot of the things that they have today. That was Lauren Little, Miss Lauren to her students. She owns Lauren Little Edutainment. You'll find a link to Lauren's website at ctpublic.org slash season. You can also follow her inspiring adventures with her students on Instagram at Miss Period Lauren Little. Don't forget, you'll find three recipes from Michael Simon's new book on our site as well. Go to ctpublic.org slash recipes. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. Seasoned is produced by Robin Doyanakin, Katie Tolarski, and Emily Cherish. Our interns are Sarah Gasparato and Michaela Savitt. Thanks for listening, everybody. You can catch past episodes of Seasoned on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to get your podcasts. Subscribe and never miss our conversations with people making great food and drink in our state and beyond. See you next week. Thank you.